The following program is a videotape production of the Maine Public Broadcasting Network. Shelley had a heron wear down to Bailey's bite and he get up to tend it in the middle of the night. Late October, midnight, black as tie. Nothing out the window but a big cold star. House like a cemetery, kitchen fire dead. I'm damn good mind, says Charlie, to go back to bed. Man who runs a herring wear, even on the side, is nothing but a slave to the goddamn tide. <laughs> well, a man feels meager, a man feels old and pitch black midnight lonesome and cold, chills in his stomach like 40,000 mice, and the very buttons on his pants, little lumps of ice. Times he gets to feeling it's no damn use, so Charlie had a pitcher full in his orange juice. And he felt better than he had before, so he had another pitcher full to last him to the shore. Down by the beach rocks under a tree, Charlie saw something he never thought he'd see. Sparkling in the lantern light as he went to pass were three big diamonds in the frosty grass. Hmm, he said, diamonds. Where'd they come from? I'll pick them up later on. I always wanted some. Then he hauled in his dory. She felt light as air. And in the dark midnight rode off to tend where. Out by the ware gate, Charlie found an old sea serpent swimming round and round. Head like a wash tub, whiskers like thatch breath like the flame on a Portland star match. Black in the lantern light, up he rose, a great big barnacle on the end of his nose. <laughs> he looked Charlie over, surly and cross. Them fish you got shut up in there belongs to my boss. Fish, says Charlie. Fish in there? Why, I ain't caught a fish since I built the damn ware. Well, says the sea serpent, nevertheless, there's 10,000 bushels at a rough guess. Charlie moved the lantern, gave his oars a pull, and he could see that ware was brim belay full. Fish rising out of water a trillion at a time, and the side of each and every one was like a silver dime. Well, says the sea serpent, what are you going to do? They're uncomfortable, and they don't belong to you, so open this contraption up and let them go. Come on, shake the lead out. The boss says so. He does, says Charlie. Who the hell is he thinks he can set back and send word to me? Hmm. Sea serpent swiveled round and made a water spout. Keep on, brother, and you'll find out. Why, Charlie says, you're nothing but a lie. So old, you're hoary. So take your dirty whiskers off the gunnel of my dory. <laughs> sea serpent twizzled, heaved underneath. Scun back a set of sharp yellow teeth. He came at Charlie with a gurgly roar, and Charlie let him have it with a port side oar. Right on the noggin, hell of a knock, and the old sea serpent sank like a rock. So go on back, yells Charlie, and tell the old jerk not to send a boy to do a man's work. Then over by the ware gate, tinkly and clear, a pretty little voice said, you hoo Charlie, dear. Now what, says Charlie, this ain't funny. And the same sweet voice says, you hoo Charlie, honey. And there on the same pole, right in the ware, was a little green mermaid combing out her hair. All right, says Charlie, I see you, and I know who you come from, so you get too. He let fly the bailing scoop, it landed with a clunk, and when the water settled, the mermaid, she had sunk. Then the ocean moved behind him with a mighty heave and hiss, and a thundery, rumbly voice remarked, I'm goddamn sick of this. <laughs> and up come an old man, white from top to toe, whiter than a daisy field, whiter than the snow, carrying a pitchfork with three tines on it, muttering in his whiskers and madder than a hornet. My sea serpent is so lame he can hardly stir, and my best mermaid, you've raised a lump on her, and you've been pretty sassy calling me a jerk. So now the old man has come to do a man's work. Look, says Charlie, why don't you leave me be? You may be the hoary old man of the sea, but I got a run of fish here shut up inside. 
You keep frigging around, you make me lose the tide. <laughs> the next thing Charlie knew, he was laying on the sand. The painter of his dory was right beside his hand. He could see across the bay, calm and still and wide. It was full daylight, and it was high tide. Hmm, says Charlie, what am I about? The oars weren't wet, so he hadn't been out. Oh, he thought, diamonds under a tree. Seems to me I found some. I'd better go see. But he couldn't find any, not one gem. Only three little owl dungs with the frost on them. <laughs> Owl Duns. <laughs> Ruth Moore sure can write some funny stories. But I don't feel like reading this morning. Well, as a fella says, if you can't dance and it's too wet to plow, you can always go visit him. I believe I'll stop in and see Bill Gunya. Understand we're going to have a moose season in Maine this year. You ever done any moose hunting? Yes, I used to do some moose hunting up in Newfoundland and Labrador. But uh, the last moose I shot a few years ago weighed about better than 1,200 pounds and over two miles from the camp. And I thought, no more of that. So from now on, I just soon watch it run around and I enjoy that more better than have it in my freezer. Mm. Yeah, I like the moose meat, all right. Oh, remind me, I heard a story about a moose. I don't know, did you ever hear that? This fellow from uh, Hartford, Connecticut, he uh, was a sportsman and he wanted to go deer hunt. So he write an answer to advertise in a magazine to go up to Moosehead Lake hunt. So he get a letter back two or three days behind that and say the best time come going to be the first November. It's going to be open season that time. So he make a reservation for that. So when it comes to the last day before November, he load all the stuff he got, put that in his automobile and he start for Bangor. But he got so far as Portland and it started for snow a little bit. He didn't like that pretty good, but it didn't snow too hard enough, so he keep go. But when he gets to Bangor, it snow hard like anything, and he looked the map, he got it. He got another 75 miles to went to. So he says, I gotta try anyway. So he made the drive, and he got the hard trouble. The snow was blowing, drifting, and bang, he got a flat rubber tire on that. <laughs> he didn't like that pretty good, too. And it was snow hard, gee, they got snow drift, everything. So anyway, he get out and change that rubber tire and he got a pump with it and then he pump full of wind, get all fixed up again. He get in, he make the drive. Anyway, it was late, it was more 12 o'clock in the night when he land up the sport camp. So he pound on the door and the boss man opened the door and looked and said, hello, that's you? And the guy said, I don't see somebody else, must be me. <laughs> so he says, well, come in. He said, why you didn't come more early than that? Well, he says, I've been all this time since yesterday, get up this place now, it's hard travel. Well, he said, you get ready, I'm going to show you a bedroom, and then I'm going to call you 4 o'clock in the morning to go hunt. So it was about 2 o'clock in the morning now when he get ready and went to bed. About 4 o'clock, the boss man come and say, get up, now it's time to get up, get breakfast, and go hunt. So he get himself up, come downstairs, and he said, boy, it didn't take long to spend all night up this place. <laughs> so anyway, he eats some brand new secondhand bean and biscuit. Then the boss man say, it's going to be daytime in a little while now, daylight, he says, so... I want you going to walk up the Toad Road and you're going to find some nice fresh deer track because it just get down snow tonight. And you follow those deer track and you're going to shoot the deers. So he say, okay. So he grabbed the gun, he got it, and he walked up the Toad Road for more a half a mile and Bombay find a nice big deer track they get always a cock, a big one. Gee, that's the one I want. So he make the side, he put the cock on his gun, you know, and he start follow those track. And he followed them all day that morning and come noon time and start the rain Rain hard and he keep falling, bum by the track, start get washed out a little bit and he didn't like that pretty good. And then he think he didn't know where he was. So he got to get back to the cabin before dark. So he turned around and he started to run back. Bum by the side get a little more dark and he go more fast. And bum by just good and dark when he land on the tot road. So anyway, he walked in the camp and dragged the gun by the muzzle. He was all bush out. And the boss man said, you got something? He says, no, he didn't. I think I'm going to went back home. Look, he said, I know you had a hard night last night and you didn't sleep very much, 
But he says, you go upstairs, took a bath, and come down and had a good hot supper, and I'm going to give you a nice drink of whiskey before supper. Tomorrow you're going to get up, rest it, and go get your dinner. and you're going to be happy after that. So he went upstairs and changed his clothes, take a bath, everything, come downstairs, and he's look for that drink. He want that, you know, boy, it was drool. So anyway, <laughs> the guy get a fit of whiskey and a little whiskey glass about that high, and he come over and he poured about half inch in the bottom of the glass. He says, here, put that under your belt. The guy looks and says, how old is it, that? And the guy says, uh, oh, I don't know, but I got it in this camp more 20 years. <laughs> Gosh, he says, he's awful small for his age. <laughs> so anyway, he drank that and didn't took too long, too, you know. But then we sit down and eat a good supper, bake bean and biscuit again, and when he get all done, he stand himself up. And, oh, well, I'm gonna went to bed, I guess, now and get ready. And he look on the wall, gee, they got a great big moose's head hang on the wall. He look on that and he say to the boss man, did you shot that? And the guy said, no, I didn't. He said, why you get it? Somebody give you that. He said, no, no, he said, last fall, he said, I was painting, do some work around the camp here. He says, and one night while I was painting the floor, I hear a noise in the window, and look, and that moose got his face stick right in the window. Gee, I was scared like anything. I blowed the land and went to bed. And the next morning, the mooses was gone. But that night, he come back again. He come back every night for about a week, about 9 o'clock in the night. And all at once, one day, the game warden come by, and I was told him about that. And he said, did you shot it? And I said, oh, no, you can't shot that. It'll close season on it. He said, that's right. He said, look, you, you were a painter on it. You must have some turpentine. Oh, yeah, I got five-gallon can turpentine. Well, he said, look, you put some in the tin can tonight. And you put that someplace where you can get it quick. And if that moose come back again, you grab that tin can and go to the window and throw that on his face. That's going to burn his eye and his mouth so bad he ain't going to run away. He ain't going to come back again. So the game warden left. He says, and that night I was working around, and sure enough, the moose come back again. So I went over and grabbed that can of turpentine, and I sneak up by the window, and he says, I wind up and let out went. And instead of hit that moose in the face, he turned around quick, going the other way, and hit him right under the tail. Burn! Boys, the boys did that burn, and that poor moose, he sat to bellow and snort and blow and paw, and he scratched himself on the stone wall, and he ran around the cabin and blow and bellow some more and paw, and back to the stone wall and scratch again. And he keep going that, that way all night long, and scratching himself, and the next morning, the guy says, I went out and pick up the head and hang it up. That's all they had left with him there. <laughs> I didn't know, did you hear that moose story or not? No, I never did. <laughs> it's quite a story. <laughs> you know, a lot of places I go talk, I told that story, and they like that. They like a lot of, a lot of story. There was another fellow from Hartford, Connecticut, came up here to Maine, you know, to go uh, deer hunting. And he get into this uh, hunting camp, and there was a whole bunch of other hunters there, and he was the newest man in the crowd, and he'd never been in the woods before in his life. And it was dark. And he was scared of Maine woods. But it was his turn to go get a bucket of water. Well, he didn't want to go, but he took that bucket anyway, and he went down to the pond to get a bucket of water for the camp. A few minutes later, back he come, and he took the door right off the hinges when he came in through, and he was scared to death. His eyes was walled right out like two doorknobs, and he'd lost the pail. And the guide says, what's the matter with you? Well, he says, when he got his breath back, he says, there's a bear in that pond. Well, the guide says, hell, that bear is as, at least as much afraid of you as you are of him. And the tenderfoot, he says, well, if that's the case, that water ain't fit to drink anyway. Oh, boy. This uh, guy had an airplane, and uh, he was down at the airport flying around, and he had enough, so he come down, he land, and run away, and then he taxi cab up to the hang up, and he would go hang this, <laughs> put his plane away. And he started to walk over toward his automobile, and he looked. He see somebody was coming toward it. He didn't know who it was, but he think he did. That looked like somebody I know, used to know who is it. So when he get more near enough, it was the guy who think it he, he is, too. So they shake hands. They was in the First World War Number 2 together, you know. <laughs> and they shake hands and talk, reminisce about this, that, and something else. And anyway, after a while, the guy say, uh, Harry, he says, uh, you like to fly? No, no, not me. He says, you don't? No. He says, boy, I like that. He says, I got a plane. He says, come on, I'm going to take you for a ride. Oh, no, he says, I don't, I'm afraid of those things. Look, you don't want to be afraid of that. Uh, one of the most safe uh, things they got in the world today, airplane. Million of those things. Oh, gee, I don't know. He says, come on, come on, don't be chicken. I'll take you for a little ride. He says, it won't be long, and I know you're going to like that. Well, he coaxed it far enough anyway, so after a while he said, okay, you're going to try it. So they both get in the airplane and he taxi cab out to the runaway and warm it up a little bit, didn't took too long, it was already hot. 
So when he started winding it up and he take it off and GD one way, fly high in the sky and it was a nice clam day, you know, the wind didn't blow. She was pretty like anything. They float along good and they keep talking. Bombay, they fly over uh, athletic field. There was a football game going down that place. So the pilot, he looked down, he said, Harry, look, they got a football game going down that place. Watch, we're going to have some fun with them. So he and you make the dive like that and go way down, almost down the ground, and everybody they run, they think they're going to be a crack up, you know, and gee, then he, he scoop up quick like that and he float up around and when he get way high again, he's there. How you like that? Boy, he said, I bet you half the people down that place thought there was going to be an accident. He said, half the people up this place did have an accident. <laughs> that story always looked so good. I don't know, do you hear one, the one about the reporter? No. This, you know, a reporter, that's the guy who writes something for the newspaper. Yeah. He got something to write about. Well, anyway, this guy was one of that. So anyway, uh, today he's going to have a different story. So he went down to the old man's home. He walked in, they got three old gentlemen there. Two was play cribbage, and the other guy sit at the table, read a book or something. And So he walked up one of the guy and he says, well, Grandpa, says, how old you are? And the old guy will look up and he says, I'm 87. Boy, that's a pretty good ripe old age. What is it you attribute your longevity on that? Well, I'll tell you, she's led a pretty good clean life, never worked too hard, never drank, never smoked, took good care of myself, and I figured that's what did it. Well, he says, that's pretty good, and he write all those stuff down, you know. So then he turned around to the other old guy and he says, Grampy, how old you are? And he look up and he says, 96. 96, yep. Boy, what do you attribute to your longevity on that? Well, pretty much like Charlie here, he says, lived a good clean life, never smoked, never drank, never bothered with the women, always got plenty of rest, went to bed early, get up early, took good care of myself and I figured that's what did it. Well, he says, that's good too. And he write all those down and he turned around and he said to the other old guy, well, Grant, what kind of life you lead? Well, he said, I'll tell you. I started drinking and smoking when I was only about knee high to nothing. Raised hell all my life. Never did anything right. Slept in a gutter more nights than I ever slept in a bed. By God, if I live the first of August, I'm going to be 58. <laughs> <laughs> that always go all right. <laughs> the old town drunk back home. He was one of them fellows that he didn't bother anybody. Everybody liked him, as a matter of fact, but he was still a town drunk. He, he drank about a quart of whiskey every day of his life. Oh, boy. And he lived quite a little while, too. And he only had one request of the town fathers, that when he died, he wanted to be cremated. Well, they didn't think anything of it, of course. The day came eventually that the old town drunk did die, and they was remembering that he wanted to be cremated. So they went ahead and made the arrangements. They had him cremated and it took three days to put the fire out. <laughs> oh yeah, that reminds me of a story about a drunk. It was uh, this guy and his wife had been married together for about 25, 30 years, you know? And uh, he's got some kind of business. I don't know what is it, but he, anyway, he had the business. And the first thing you know, business started It'd be not so good like it used to be. Well, he didn't like that pretty good, so he started work more hard. But business still keep going down the hill. And he worked hard like anything and keep getting worse. First thing you know, he started for drink a little bit. That didn't help pretty good, too. Because the more he drank, the more worse the business get it. And because the more worse the business get, the more he drunk. The first thing he didn't know, he was an alcoholic. He was drunk all the time. So anyway, his wife done everything she could and couldn't get him rid of, rid of the liquor. He drank all the time. So anyway, she decided she's gonna left him. So she pack up all the clothes she got it and fill a couple of suitcase. And then she stop and think, it's kind of too bad after you've been married with one guy for 25, 30 years and go left it like that. She said, I'm gonna try one other thing. So she put the clothes away and she went down to see the minister. She told the minister the trouble she got it and wanna know he can prescribe something that she's gonna do that's gonna save the marriage. Well, he say, uh, he drunk all the time, he says. She said, yes. He said, did you try to broke it? Broke it? She said, I done everything but broke that neck he got. Well, yeah, but did you try something else? She says, look, I make him sleep on a porch. I knock him down. She says, I scold him. I do everything. Don't let him, never mind. He drunk, he come back home drunk just the same. 
Well, he said, did you try to be good with him? She said, how you can be good with somebody who don't like it? Well, he says, you must have liked the guy one time you married. Yeah, but he didn't drink that time, and now he do. Yeah, but she, he says, uh, why you don't try to be good with him? And maybe the surprise is going to shock him so much he's going to stop drink. Well, she said, I don't believe that's going to work, but I'll try it. So she went home. Like all the other time, she do the housework, something, he come in, went right upstairs to the bathroom, change his clothes, shave and fix his haircut, come downstairs, grab the door and open, he says, I'll see you later, and how'd he go? Uh, she says, that's the last time I'm going to see her sober again. So she put her on in the evening, then watched television a while, along about 10 o'clock, she brought the lamp, she sit in the window and watch. 11 o'clock, he didn't come yet. 12 o'clock, he didn't come again. 1 o'clock, he didn't come that time. About two inches before two, before she see him come up the sidewalk. Drunk like a teddy bear. He's got all the sidewalk and half the road with him. <laughs> Bump in a telephone pole, stop and excuse himself. Start again. Oh, did he have a load on. Oh, my gosh. She says, I got to go face the music again. So she get up, open the door, and went down a step and go down the sidewalk to meet it. She says, oh, Harry, you don't feel pretty good, huh? Oh, he says, I'm all right. She says, look, now you put your arm around me, and I'm going to put my arm around you. The other arm around the fence, so we all three ain't going to fall down. And she's helping along, and it got a hard trouble. She gets to the doorstep, but she get him up over that in a while and in through the door. And when he's got that far, she push it. He landed right in a big easy chair. Thank God for that, she said. So she went in and take off the two shoes, put on the bed slipper, take off the necktie and unbutton his shirt. Then she went upstairs to the bathroom and get a dish rag with cold water and wash his two face and hand and comb the haircut. And there, she says, you look more better already, honey. Come on, sweetheart. She says, we're going to go upstairs and go to bed now, and tomorrow morning you're going to feel all like a brand new man. Well, he says, I'm much as well, so I'm going to get hell when I get home anyway. <laughs> this fellow, he went in, a, he was a little Frenchman. He was only about that old. And he, he walked in the saloon, and he throw 25 cents on the corner there. He said to the bartender, I'd like to have a glass of beer. So the bartender pumped him one of that, and he slide the glass over. And the little Frenchman reached up and grabbed that glass, and take that, take a slip in it, put that back. And then he put his feet on that handlebar on the bottom there. <laughs> and he was smack his lip, you know, like that. And about that time, the big guy right near him, he chopped up, chopped up, chopped up. Down the poor guy went just like a bag of rock. And he looked up, he said, why you done that? And the big guy laughed. He said, that was Karakit from China. The little Frenchman, he didn't like that pretty good. Anyway, he reached up, took the glass, took another slip, put that back again. He put his feet on that handlebar again, and he think, I wonder why, because he done that. And about that time, chop, 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 and down he go again. Poor little buggy turned around, he said, why you done that? The big guy laughed, and he said, that was judo from Japan. The little Frenchman, he didn't like that so good, he did the first one. He reached up, took the glasses, and he drank them all, and he put that back again. And he run out to his automobile and he come back in with a paper bag in his hand. He sneak up behind that big guy and he clunk. Gee, the guy went down like I'm dead. He <laughs> said, the Frenchman said to the bartender, when that guy come to, tell him that was a tire iron from Sears Robot. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, you know, you know, I want to get start to tell a story. I don't know if to stop it, so I might as well keep going. When you got enough, you can tell me about that. <laughs> It was a fellow one time, he didn't have a job anymore. He used for had one, but he lost it, so now he ain't got one. And he do, couldn't find one. He answered all the advertising they got in the paper, but nobody, they didn't hire it. So Bombay didn't have something to eat, so he'd go down to City Hall. And he'd go see the city management, and he'd say, Mr. Management, he says, I got to have some help. He says, I got a family and my wife, and I ain't got a job, and I can't feed it. I ain't got something else to eat, so I wish you were going to help me. The guy say, well, did you try to get a job? He said, I try uh, everything. Any way I hear about a job, I go look for that, but I can't get it. Well, he said, did we give you a job work for the city? Did you will took that? Yeah, sure. Well, okay, you come in tomorrow morning, we're going to give you a job. So the next morning, he came in, and the boss say, uh, you're going to come with me today. So he took it in a pickup truck with him, and he went away up to the town line. And he get out, and he say, now I want you to take that bucket of paint and that three-inch brush, and I want you to paint a white stripe right down the middle of the road all the way across town to the next town line. Okay. So he painted all that day, and late that afternoon, the boss think about the guy, and gee, I better go see what he done. So he went up and looked, and the, the guy was a good worker. He painted a strip three miles long that day. The boss said, boy, that's a big day's work. 
So he went home, and the next morning when the guy came in, the guy, the boss said, you go pick up where you left off yesterday. Okay. So he went up, and that day he painted again, and when come night, the boss went and looked, and he painted two miles that day. So that's all right. The next morning he said to him, you go back to the same place where you left off. And he done that. So late that afternoon, the boss went over to see what he done. That day he only painted one mile. He said, I wonder what happened. Three mile one day, two, and then one. So he drove down to the guy's house, see it. The guy come to the door and he said, you like your job, paint? Oh, sure, anything. He says, uh, you like that? And the guy says, yeah, you've done a nice job. Well, he says, thank you. He said, that first day, he said, you paint three mile. Yeah, that's good? Yeah, very good. Well, he said, thank you. He said, yesterday, you, you paint only two mile. Yeah, that's good? Yeah, that's good, too. Today, you only paint one mile. What happened? What happened? Don't forget, he says, my paint bucket is six miles up the road. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you a cute little story. Somebody asked me, and I say that. There's a teacher one time in a schoolhouse. She asked all the kids, did they're going to be good that morning? Study hard and don't whisper and mind their own business. And this afternoon, she says, I'll take you to the zoo. So the children all buckle down, you know, and they study hard and they didn't whisper they was good kids. So it's after dinner time, the teacher says, well, to the kid now, you was good this morning. I told you I'm going to take you to the zoo, so I'm going to take you with it now. She says, ain't too far enough to the zoo, so we're going to walk. So they all follow the teacher and walk up the sidewalk a little way, and they come to the zoo. They walk in, they got a big elephant in their cages. And so she says, one of the kid, what kind of animal is that? And the little boy looked, he said, that's an elephant. She says, uh, how do you know that? He said, I can tell it was a great big, big animal with big flappy ears and a tail on both ends, you know? She said, yeah, that's an elephant. So they went to the next cage, and there was a tiger. And she said to one of the kid, what kind of animal is that? And the little boy looked and said, that's a tiger. She says, how do you know that? He says, because it looks, it builds just like a great big cat, and it got striped go all around it. That's a tiger. She says, yeah, that's right. So they went to the next cages, and they got a baboon in a cage. So she said to one of the kids, she says, what kind of animal is that? And the little boy looked and said, I don't know. She says, you don't know what is it? He said, no. Well, she tell me, she says, you tell me what is it. He said, I don't know what it is, too. She says, you don't know what that animal is? He says, no. Well, come. She says, somebody must know what is it. She says, you know what it is? Somebody put up the hand. She looked and by this little girl. She put up the hand like that and then take it down again. So the teacher says, you know what is it, Margaret? She says, I don't know, but I think I do. Well, she says, what is it? She says, well, I think by the expression on his face and the calluses on his rear end, she says, I think it must be a truck driver. <laughs> If I didn't know people like Bill Gagne, I think this long, mean winter probably would drive me crazy. The Night Charlie Tended Wear is from a collection of ballads by main author Ruth Moore. The collection is entitled Cold as a Dog in the Wind Nor'east and was copyrighted by the author in 1958. 